Let me begin with a story. A story that combines modernization, reform, resistance, and imperialism. Let me take you back to the 1870s, to Egypt and Sudan, where a Muslim cleric named Muhammad Ahmad was attracting a large following. Referring to himself as the Mahdi, an Arabic word meaning the guided one, the charismatic leader opposed the modern reforms that were being enacted by the Egyptian state. You see, Egypt's government had hoped to avoid the fates of India and China, where the British Empire had exploited delayed efforts to modernize. Think the Opium War here. But many of its policies, such as the abolition of the Islamic slave trade and the confiscation of Sudanese lands, threatened the power of traditional leaders, such as the Mahdi. What's more, Egypt's construction of the Suez Canal had racked up a crippling debt to British companies. In 1881, Egypt attempted to have the Mahdi arrested. The mission failed. The Mahdi assembled an army. Meanwhile, the British grew concerned that political unrest would deny their shareholders the opportunity to recoup investments. As a result, in 1882, British troops occupied Egypt. Over the course of the next few years, the Mahdi and his warriors fought ferociously against Egyptian soldiers, now led by British officers. Superior training and captured rifles allowed the Mahdi armies to win key battles, perhaps most notably in 1885 at the Battle of Khartoum. There, Mahdi forces overwhelmed the British and Egyptian garrisons. Virtually none of the city's defenders survived. That same year, the Mahdi died of typhus, but his legacy lived on. Then several important developments occurred that solidified the power of the British Empire and other European empires in Africa. First, effective treatments for tropical diseases, such as the use of quinine to suppress the symptoms of malaria, became more widespread. Second, the Berlin Conference of 1885 divided Africa between European powers thus preventing accidental wars. And third, the use of modern weaponry became more widespread. Which takes us back to Sudan and the Mahdi rebels. By 1898, the British Empire, emboldened by the aforementioned diplomatic and technological developments, decided to stamp out the Mahdi once and for all. On September 2nd, roughly 8,000 British and 17,000 Egyptian soldiers fought more than 50,000 Mahdi warriors at the Battle of Amdurman. This time, the British employed high-powered artillery and machine guns to enormous effect. The Mahdi lost over half its force, with 12,000 dead and 13,000 wounded or missing. The British lost 47 men. The story of the Mahdi uprising is but one of many similar narratives that make up the age of imperialism. But what was imperialism? Traditions and Encounters describes imperialism as the domination of European powers, and later the United States and Japan, over subject lands in the larger world. Take note that this occurred, from roughly the mid-19th century to World War II, in Asia, Africa, and throughout the Pacific Rim. The French controlled West Africa and Southeast Asia, Germany held colonies in Africa and the Pacific. The Dutch controlled what is now Indonesia. Japan extended into Taiwan and Korea. The United States into the Philippines. And of course, the largest empire of all was the British Empire, upon which the sun was said to never set. As for why it happened, it essentially boils down to modernization. Those societies that had modernized invariably were the ones to subjugate developing societies, not the other way around. The less modern a society was, politically, economically, socially, and culturally, the more likely it was to be subjugated by an imperial power. Again, remember the Opium War. This is what made modernization so important in the eyes of contemporaries. The final defeat of Mahdi forces is a testament to this as were countless other lopsided military victories during the age of imperialism. And consider this, in the year 1900, only 500 British soldiers 
were stationed throughout all of Nigeria, a colony with millions of people. I'll also add that resources crucial to industrialized economies, oil, rubber, tungsten, copper, as well as traditional luxury resources, golden gems for example, were further incentives for imperialists, as was nationalism, particularly among European powers. Into the early 20th century, no European nation wanted to fall behind any other European nation. But it's also important to remember that imperial powers justified their superiority over less civilized people, at least as they saw it, by inventing concepts of racial superiority. European scholars such as Herbert Spencer spearheaded this ideology, known as social Darwinism. Rudyard Kipling used it to persuade the United States to occupy the Philippines, and the self-proclaimed superiority of the Japanese race, as they saw it again, was used to legitimize imperial ventures into Taiwan, Korea, and later China. As for how we know, be sure to read the primary sources listed on your syllabus, especially that of Rudyard Kipling. After all, his poem, The White Man's Burden, was instrumental to American imperialism. As for why we care, it's crucial to remember that these empires were forged by violence that imperialism led simultaneously to global integration and Eurocentrism. Be sure to keep this in mind. Until next time.